1890 census indicated the western frontier was closed. Census data showed that all of the land west of the Mississippi River was settled, presumably ending centuries of conquest. Historian Frederick Jackson Turner publicized the census data, famously describing the settlement of the West as a so-called frontier process, where immigrants became Americans by confronting and conquering what he called a virgin land. For those like future President Theodore Roosevelt, who viewed the process of Western settlement as the quintessential experience that made America exceptional and superior to other nations, the notion of a closed frontier caused great anxiety. Despite the census evidence, people could still find plenty of open Western spaces in the post-Civil War decades. Significant sections of the West remained virtually empty well into the 20th century. Between 1877 and 1900, millions of people from all points of the globe in every region of the United States moved into the West. Within the West, internal migrations reshaped the region's character, depopulating some areas and resettling others. But many of those who sought frontier opportunity in the West ended up in cities. By 1890, the vast majority of Western migrants had settled in cities like Denver, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Salt Lake City, and hundreds of towns scattered like islands in an ocean of sparsely inhabited land. In contrary to popular perception, the West was the most urban region in the U.S. and remains so today. The lure of open land, farming, and remote mines scattered people throughout the West, but environmental and economic forces drew them together again in cities. Denver and San Francisco were so-called instant cities that grew from tiny outposts to booming metropolitan areas in less than a decade and boasted all the luxuries of Eastern society. These cities grew so quickly because of changing post-Civil War migration patterns. After the Civil War, patterns changed for several reasons. Railroads made foreign and internal immigration far easier. Internal migration also increased with rapidly expanding regional railroad networks. Economic downturns, environmental disasters, and an influx of new immigrants who lowered wages and often raised prejudices in other regions pushed internal and foreign migrants to the West. In 1877, tens of thousands of African-American exodusters, fleeing rising racial violence at the end of military reconstruction, migrated from the South to the West, founding new towns and joining other workers and entrepreneurs hoping for a new start. All of them were pulled by the lure of new opportunities and moved frequently to take advantage of emerging markets and employment. Women moved with their families and on their own, and contributed a disproportionate amount of the daily labor required to establish businesses, homes, towns, and communities across the West. Women's diaries of migrations reveal much of what historians know of daily life in the history of settlement. European and Euro-American women responsible for inhabiting a little understood region faced environmental challenges that Native American women had known for thousands of years. Mobility was a key characteristic of the global economy in the 19th century. The American frontier experience was not unique. So-called settler societies in South America, Australia, and Canada also depended on significant internal and external migrations to solidify control of vast territories and negotiate with or displace indigenous peoples ahead of state-sponsored efforts. But no destination compared to the U.S. and the astounding diversity of immigrants pouring into a region already incredibly multicultural. There were many melting pots around the globe, but these melted just two or three predominant immigrant groups. In the U.S., and in the West in particular, immigrants from virtually everywhere lived together with thousands of Native Americans, freed slaves, Hispanics of many origins, Asians, and Euro-Americans of all types. The existence of a highly mobile, multicultural workforce enabled the astonishingly rapid rise of the West from periphery to center. Mobility and diversity were powerful engines of change that benefited the economy and nation.
This combination of forces, however, provided exceptional opportunities for some individuals and groups, while crushing and dividing others. Although the Chinese are remembered primarily in American history for their role in building the Transcontinental Railroad, their importance in the West extended far beyond that single event. Chinese immigrants who came to work on the railroads, mines, and fields were part of a global Chinese diaspora that sold contract Chinese laborers and Chinese women as indentured laborers and sex workers who lived little better than slaves. From the 1840s to the 1870s, Chinese immigrants, free or contracted, moved to Australia, Southeast Asia, Peru, Cuba, and California. Those who migrated left sparse opportunities, a rigid class system, and grinding poverty in 19th century South China. Businesses often sought out Chinese workers for their cheap and exploitable labor with the assumption that they would eventually return to China. They usually migrated as individuals and were overwhelmingly male in the first waves, but were later joined by women and entire families, and during all phases of immigration, quickly developed community-building strategies to combat racism and segregation. The Chinese managed to build successful enclaves wherever they went, anchored by temples like the Bok Kai Temple of Marysville, California, or woven into instant cities like Denver and San Francisco, Chinatowns became a lasting characteristic of the Western urban landscape. The Chinese were indispensable to Western development. In California, they comprised half of all agricultural workers. In urban areas and on ranches, Chinese men occupied up to 90% of service industry jobs like laundry and food preparation. During the heyday of Western expansion, the Chinese were even tolerated and sometimes given grudging respect. But starting in the 1870s, anti-Chinese sentiment increased as the Western economy gained importance. In a pattern that repeated throughout the 20th century, communities and industries built by the cheapest foreign labor source turned against these workers once they achieved community and economic stability. The Australians set precedent for Americans to follow by enacting Chinese exclusion acts as early as the 1850s. Urged along by white labor organizers, anti-Chinese leagues, and community leaders, Western states passed laws limiting Chinese opportunities and rights through the 1870s. State laws and political enthusiasm prompted the U.S. Congress to pass the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. The act, which nominally suspended immigration, was renewed and tightened over the years until harsh immigration restrictions enacted in the early 1920s ended virtually all Asian immigration to the U.S. In addition, several Western states passed laws restricting Chinese and later Japanese land ownership and barred them from several professions. As a consequence of these restrictions, immigration from Mexico rose to meet the need for cheap labor in the California fields. Greeks, Poles, Russians, Japanese, and representatives of virtually every nation diversified the region during the critical period of Western settlement. None of these groups would have come to the West without the systemic support for settlement and industry provided by the U.S. federal government. In the West, the federal government developed the core legislative and administrative institutions of a powerful modern nation. The Homestead Act of 1862, passed during the Civil War by a Congress free of Southern opposition, reflected the ideals and goals of a Republican U.S. In keeping with the Jeffersonian vision of a nation of small farmers, the federal government sought to extend the system of individual land ownership west. The Homestead Act, expanding the basic system of settlement established by the Ordinance of 1785, provided a means for privatizing expansive western public lands. Before the Civil War, homesteading west of the Mississippi River had proved problematic for individual families, as cheap lands intended for individuals quickly evolved into a commercialized system of land speculation. The Homestead Act provided title to 160-acre parcels for individuals who made improvements to the land over a period of five years. 
Settlers had the option to purchase the land for $1.25 per acre after the first six months of residency, and some opted to pay up front to secure mortgages to fund improvements. This option encouraged speculation by allowing homesteaded land to be brought into the commercial market a quarter section at a time at a higher resale value. Rather than improving the land, homesteaders often sold out to other individuals or commercial farms that grew grain crops over vast acreages. For those homesteading west of Dodge City, Kansas, on the 100th meridian, the geographic line of aridity where the annual rainfall drops below 8 inches per year, 160 acres required expensive irrigation works for farming or other dryland farming techniques. These parcels were also far too small for ranching. In addition, five years was too long to develop the land without the benefit of ownership and access to loans. Congress addressed these problems in 1877 with the Desert Lands Act. The act, applicable in 11 western states, allowed for homesteading on 640-acre parcels of arid land at 25 cents per acre and provided title within three years for a dollar an acre for settled, irrigated land. But there was no official definition of how much land and water constituted irrigated cultivation. For much of the desert west, agriculture required massive federal support that came with the creation of the Reclamation Service in 1902. The renamed Bureau of Reclamation, or BOR, eventually funded extensive irrigation projects in 16 western states. The simple act of providing land and water to farmers and ranchers enormously expanded the growth and reach of the federal government. Despite an emphasis on individual land ownership, the landscape and environment of the American West resisted familiar patterns of development. As a result, vast sections of public land, especially in the Great Basin, stayed in the hands of the federal government until the 1930s. For migrants converging on the west from all directions, federal lands and mineral acts provided a semblance of structure to the spasmodic rushes that characterized settlement prior to the Civil War. Where the gold and silver rushes of the 1840s and 1850s left concentrated populations in the Mountain West, the surveys and land acts opened the floodgates for massive migration to the Great Plains region beyond the Missouri River. Perception and myth, as much as fact, powered land fevers that drew millions from the furthest reaches of the globe into one of the world's harshest environments. It's hard to overestimate the power of perception in the creation of the West as both a geographical region and an ideal with a lasting global appeal. In 1895, future President Woodrow Wilson wrote, The West has been the great word of our history. The Westerner has been the type and master of our American life. The great word was always more myth than truth, not entirely false, but a powerful idea with enough fact to motivate millions to move great distances and suffer enormous hardships. The mythic version of the Western story is still celebrated in literature, on film, and on TV. But the myth had a dark side. It justified the mistreatment of Indians in their ancestral environment and contributed to the class and racial conflicts that characterized the post-Civil War West. Promoters and boosters lured settlers, workers, and investors to the region by steadfastly portraying the West as a paradise to be tamed and civilized. Western boosters were masters of public relations and emerging techniques of advertising. Using all of the new mass media at their disposal, such as dime novels, traveling shows, posters, pamphlets, newspapers, graphic art, in photography, they promoted places that didn't yet exist and invented simple solutions to complex cultural and environmental dilemmas. Boosters, for instance, dismissed the lack of water in much of the region with claims like, the rain follows the plow. The faith that ingenuity, technology, and hard work could transform even the weather was widespread 
and push global migrations to the West. But global droughts throughout the late 1880s demonstrated how quickly fertile soil, once stripped of its native cover and tilled, could burn and blow away along with the hopes of settlers. While boosters and promoters made wild claims for the West, early settlers also generated widely circulated literature such as memoirs and other fictionalized accounts of the frontier process. As individuals or collectively through so-called pioneer societies, settlers lamented the passing of a grand age, even as they exaggerated the savagery of the land and peoples they thought they had conquered. Settlers, together with an influential group of artists, authors, dreamers, and deceivers, created such a powerful, persuasive mythology that even savvy observers had trouble discerning truth from fiction. No one man blended history and myth better than William Buffalo Bill Cody. He was literally a legend in his own time, a man simultaneously a real person and a fictional character of international fame. His heavily embellished life story of migration as a youth from Leclerc, Iowa to the west, over the plains and through the Rockies, encompassed all the experiences global audiences recognized as part of the western frontier life, such as buffalo hunting, Indian fighting, bronco busting, gunslinging, and military scouting. In the 1880s, Cody's Wild West shows featured real-life Westerners recreating idealized versions of the actual history unfolding in the region at the same time. Cody traveled the world, introducing Indian resistance leaders like Sitting Bull to Queens and the young German Kaiser Wilhelm, along with hordes of commoners from Paris to Poland. These globetrotting shows provided one of many powerful nodes of transnational cultural exchange linking the frontier west to the rest of the world. Even as millions of immigrants crossed oceans from all directions to reach an actual place they knew as the west, Cody and other Americans, by taking the mythic west out to the world, left an indelible impression of a particular facet of American identity that celebrated individual violence and heroic conquest. But the reality of violence and valor in the region was far more complex. Dime novels, Wild West shows, and the 20th century movies yet to come told stories of righteous individual violence. The Western genre in all its forms had two basic narratives. One, the gunfight in the street between a good man and an outlaw. And two, brave pioneers versus murderous Indians. Foreign authors such as German Karl May, who never traveled to the West, sold millions of stories of individual violence that circled the globe. Buffalo Bill raised the appetite for them by reenacting an idealized version of regional violence. Figures like the young criminal Billy the Kid gained international fame for exploits that bore little resemblance to their decidedly unromantic lives. Thousands died bloody deaths in the violent West, but rarely were they lone figures dueling heroically in the streets. Individual violence was most often criminal or reckless, with cheap alcohol as the fuel. Collective violence was disturbingly premeditated and often carried out by otherwise upstanding community members or soldiers. The myth of individual violence conceals a more disturbing reality of group violence involving regular citizens and whole communities. Horrific organized violence against Indians, such as the profoundly disturbing Sand Creek and Wounded Knee massacres, was much more brutal and common than were gunfights. The idea that military action or group vigilantism provided a necessary corrective to the disorder of the frontier justified much of the violence in the West well into the 20th century. Prominent community and religious leaders joined so-called vigilance leagues in San Francisco and Denver. Western papers wrote favorably about vigilante lynching mobs that saved county money and time by executing criminals without delay or due process. Western corporations often hired thugs to break strikes, 
remove unwanted workers, or impose order by threatening violence in company camps and towns. Generous federal land grants and subsidies pushed the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. When finished, it opened the Great Plains and connected the Pacific to the Atlantic and Gulf ports, spring rapid global exchange. In 1869, the driving of the Golden Spike linking the last rail from east to west ended the first phase of Western Railroad development. Between 1869 and 1900, regional railroad entrepreneurs like the so-called Empire Builder, James J. Hill, stepped in when the robber barons of the transcontinental epoch moved onto greener pastures. A Canadian, Hill migrated to St. Paul, Minnesota, and saw opportunity for transportation development across the northern borderlands. Hill first linked the expanse of Canadian prairie with the Great Plains and distant markets with lines between St. Paul and Winnipeg, Canada. Throughout the 1880s, Hill connected the Great Northern Railway lines east to Chicago, and finally in 1893, west to Seattle and the Pacific. Regional rail development in the 1880s and 1890s used 25% of U.S. annual timber production and spawned the massive or bonanza wheat farms of the Dakotas and the fruit and vegetable economies of Arizona and California. Western coal mining grew from regional rail demands for cheaper energy. A combination of federal land grants and savvy land deals with boosters and politicians gave the railroads massive checkerboard tracts of land to sell to cash-poor migrants. Although land was cheap, transportation costs weren't. Farmers and ranchers who bought land from the railroads or acquired homesteads depended on the railroad for access to the world markets that dictated the values of their crops and animals. The railroads even set the farmers' clocks when they established time zones in the 1880s. The large distances traversed by U.S. and Canadian railroads especially necessitated a closely regulated system of time to replace the confusion of the solar time that shaped the lives of humans for millennia. Railroad land grants continue to this day to shape life and economies in the West, where companies like the Southern Pacific maintain large land holdings and control critical transportation corridors. During the heyday of the 1880s, rail competition drove down transportation costs in most parts of the West. Farmers both benefited and suffered from greater access to national and international markets facilitated by powerful railroad corporations. Through lean times, farmers borrowed heavily to finance future crops and pay shipping. When the fickle environment cooperated, farmers used new technologies like the McCormick harvesting machine to produce massive yields that drove down prices of staples like wheat. Unlike industrial capitalists, Individual farmers rarely benefited from economies of scale. The harder they worked, the more efficient they were, the less they profited. The populist movement rose from the ashes of the arid conditions of the 1890s when farm economies collapsed. Geographically dispersed farmers seeking collective organization faced significant challenges. They united first through social organizations like the Grange and then political alliances that link South and West. Encouraged by fiery leaders like Mary Elizabeth Lease to raise less corn and more hell, farmers formalized their populist party at an 1892 convention in Omaha, Nebraska. The Omaha platform advocated socialization of the nation's railroads and other far-sighted reforms aimed at empowering family farmers in the industrial age. In the long run, agribusiness, industrial ranching, and federal subsidies provided the only consistently successful method for reaping the riches of the plains. In the 1880s and 1890s, military action and federal legislation in tandem with cultural and economic forces erased established Indian territorial lines drawn under the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1851 and thus drastically reduced the amount of Indian-controlled land and isolated them against their will on small, scattered reservations. <laughs> 
The visible boundaries of Indian lands could still be mapped in the late 1870s, but they remained contested regions. The lines on maps only provided an illusion of geographic organization during a time of shifting borders, tribal movements and alliances, and, of course, disastrous government policies. Indian commissioners and leaders of various Christian denominations provided Indians with food and clothing in exchange for promises to abandon cultural traditions and to assimilate into American society. Simultaneously, Indians were pushed, often under direct military threat, to move to increasingly smaller reservations on land considered unsuitable for migrant settlement or industry. By the late 1880s, the U.S. government acknowledged that the only Indian territory left was that on rapidly shrinking reservations. At the same time, and with strong public support, the U.S. military waged constant war with the same people that Indian commissioners and the U.S. Department of the Interior were trying to assimilate. Of the tensions that define the peace policy era, few were more divisive than Indian education. The idea was simple. Take children away from their so-called ignorant parents and backward communities and train them to be Americans who cherish individualism and republicanism over tribal life. Reformers, convinced that the time for fighting had passed, called for an army of Christian school teachers to lead Indian children from barbarism towards civilization and salvation. In 1870, Congress supported assimilation with a $100,000 appropriation to establish federal industrial schools mainly on existing reservations. These early efforts often failed because Indian parents resented efforts to dismantle their cultures through their children and because students simply ran away. Administrators ultimately replaced reservation-based day schools with remote boarding schools, which separated children from their parents for extended periods of time. In 1879, 84 Lakota children became the first students at the Carlisle, Pennsylvania Indian Training School. Their education there marked the beginning of a generation-long effort to assimilate Indian children coercively in 81 schools from Carlisle to Riverside, California. Carlisle School founder Richard Henry Pratt studied the Hampton model as he developed his ideas for an Indian school system. The story of Indian education is complicated. Students sometimes went willingly to the boarding schools for personal reasons or as an escape from the humiliation and privation of the reservation. Other students were lured with vague promises of exciting trips. Some parents willingly signed over their children hoping that education promised them a better way of life. Others signed without realizing their children would be sent far away for extended periods. The Indian children, of course, or the most painful burden as they left their families for the military-like routines of boarding school. Many years later, Plenty Kill, a Lakota Sioux, remembered a sad scene as Indian children said goodbye to their parents. Separation from their parents was the first step in a process that isolated Indian children from their culture and traditions. At the schools, teachers gave children new names and clothes, uniforms for boys, and long dresses for girls. The setting, lifestyle, and curriculum were all designed to teach Indian children to conform to the white ways of the world. At Carlisle, Pratt told arriving students and visitors that he would, quote, kill the Indian to save the man. The perceived closing of the frontier and unprecedented conquest of the environment between 1877 and 1900 caused anxiety about the depletion of resources and destruction of natural wonders. As Americans saw their manifest destiny of a transcontinental empire achieved, frontier nostalgia shaped culture and policy. The need to protect what remained of the frontier gained national attention as early as the 1870s. Eastern and European travelers, lured to the exotic Wild West by writers such as Mark Twain and artist Thomas Moran, found natural wonders but also graphic evidence of human impact. Even from train windows, tourists viewed mountains of buffalo skeletons, denuded forests, 
toxic mining waste and blasted landscapes, as well as trails of discarded possessions. In the mid-19th century, publicity about the so-called discovery of the Yosemite Valley and several nearby groves of giant sequoia trees prompted the first western tourist rush. Recognizing the area's unique scenery and tourism potential, Congress reserved the land for public use. Yellowstone in the northwest corner of the Wyoming Territory became America's first official national park on March 1, 1872, when President U.S. Grant signed an act designating over 2.2 million acres of geological wonders as a so-called pleasure and ground for the benefit and enjoyment of the people. While the government worked out environmental policies in the parks and forests, a wave of grassroots environmental concern ignited a popular preservation movement. Naturalist John Muir formalized the movement with the founding of the Sierra Club in 1892. The Sierra Club was an example of growing national concern for the intrinsic value of nature. Inspired by transcendentalist authors like Walt Whitman and Henry David Thoreau, Preservationists advocated the permanent protection of wilderness for its own sake. Their efforts bolstered the utilitarian arguments for conservation expressed by concerned observers such as Theodore Roosevelt and scientists like Gifford Pinchot. Roosevelt and other conservationists worried about the wanton waste of resources and especially forests intentionally burned to destroy Indian refuges or to further the charcoal trade and construction of mines. Industrial timber harvesting, which was reducing American forests at unprecedented rates, created support for government regulation of this vital resource. Amendment 24 of the General Appropriations Act of 1891 gave the U.S. President authority to remove forested lands from the public domain and protect them from exploitation. This law brought millions of acres under federal protection during the 1890s and early 20th century. Pinchot traveled to France and Germany to learn the techniques of scientific forestry. He returned with a vision for the wise use of natural resources for the greatest good to the greatest number for the longest time. America's first professionally trained forester, Pinchot enforced the Appropriations Act first as a member of the National Forest Commission and then as head of the U.S. Division of Forestry. In the early 1900s, he worked with Theodore Roosevelt to dramatically expand the land management role of the federal government. In the space of only three decades, the West had developed to the extent that many believed government protection was the only way to avoid wholesale destruction of the region. The collective realization that the seemingly unlimited resources of the West were finite marked a critical juncture in American history. I stood on the bridge at midnight, 